Okay, welcome back to the channel. This is going to be the final commentary in our crash course, video number 12. Uh, can't believe we're finally here. It's been a year. Thank you, everybody, for all of your support along the way. Um, for people that aren't used to this format or you're just being introduced to the channel and my content, this is kind of where I go over all of the questions and comments from my last video. Make sure to stick around if you're thinking of clicking away because it's not, um, you know, an interesting or appealing type of format. A lot of people have the same types of questions when it comes to getting introduced to AIM training. And I think you'll find that you will learn a lot uh, just by me going through a lot of the same types of questions that people ask. And also a major shout out to my editor, uh, Letter Dex. Uh, make sure to check his stuff out. He is going to have to go through the painful process of correcting all my mistakes and compiling all of this into one singular vision so thank you dex so this isn't a question but this is from uh, i believe it's crossy uh i always mispronounce this he says he agrees with the aiming for the center of mass that's why using easier scenarios and people think they need works pretty well when it comes to learning good habits and control so crossy first of all is a uh, top tier aimer, um, somebody that I look up to a lot and look to for advice and guidance on like how to properly approach aim technique. What you can do if you're playing scenarios that have larger targets to increase the difficulty of that scenario, you can actually just always aim for center mass of the bot like constantly. Like that can be your challenge for yourself in instead of just crutching you know the large bot by you know following the edge of the bot for example. So that's a good tip for anybody that's you know playing tracking scenarios and wants to make sure that they're getting their technique right like always be looking for that next step of like how to improve instead of just you know getting a perfect score because you're the targets are so freaking large that it's easy to do so now that you've made a video for almost every category i gotta ask do you think it's better to do each category one at a time or focus on improving them all at once so to me i think the most important thing is to do what keeps you interested and engaged that that's the most important thing. I don't think there is any optimal way to approach a mechanics. I, I would say if possible to try to improve everything overall. Uh, a lot of people get lost down that rabbit hole of like crutching one category and then they kind of regret it. But I would say it's one of those things that's like it doesn't matter as much as you probably think it does um, because there's a lot of similar characteristics across multiple different types of categories and aim mechanics they have a lot of shared characteristics and so like for example when you're training with dynamic clicking you'll be getting a lot of like fingertip and wrist control which will help you with reactive and vice versa so it's like it's not like you'll just lose out by purely chasing one mechanic or the other so question could you go into a bit of depth as to what makes a close scenario different from a mid or far scenario how does our perception change the bot's apparent distance from the player makes it more or less challenging to read this is like i've been studying this quite a lot because you know there's a lot of mantras in the aim community about depth and how that matters and like i said in the video i've even gone into it myself when i was kind of parroting what was in the aim community in my settings video um i really now understand like if you learn about how our eyes work and i talked about this in reactivity a little bit we, we have just basically really advanced cameras that where our brain has to construct more or less what it sees is flat images when it when it pushes up against the back of our lens and then our brain like connects the dots and makes it appear 3d and it does that through key visual cues like motion for example so i mean ultimately you know there's no there's, there's nothing different from something that's far off in the distance and something that's close other than the fact that when it's closer it is going to appear to be moving much faster and it is going to appear larger uh so that's why it's more difficult to keep track of ultimately when it's close is because you know when it's moving five miles an hour off in the distance it looks like it's barely moving but when it's moving five miles an hour and it's right up in front of your face, it looks really fast. So that's really all it comes down to. If it was moving 500 miles an hour off in the distance, it also looked like it was moving really fast. So um, you just really have to become comfortable with tracking 
a very fast moving and highly reactive bot. That's what it comes down to. Like if you're playing Overwatch, like a tracer type character, you know, somebody who just has high amounts of uh, velocity and acceleration. So are you going to make a video on strafe shooting scenarios where you start to add in movement to your aim training? I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I've kind of floated the idea of doing at least hand interdependence uh, type, like as like a bonus to the series but as far as like strafe aiming, I think like that starts to go and, and let me back up with by hand interdependence, you mean like your ability to control your crosshair uh, while you're moving. Like, so that's one one concept. It doesn't really matter how you're moving. It's just the fact that you are moving and having understanding the relationship between your movement and where the crosshair is going. That's one topic. And then another topic is the art of like strafing like and then there's a whole like if you read aimer 7's guide on it it's actually really good uh on all the different types of strafe aiming you know like trapezoid types and rhombus and you know just your typical ad spam and there's all sorts of different types um and that to me that i'm not really qualified to do that like i would want to see that type of guide from somebody who has you know five to ten years of fps experience you know which isn't me i've only got maybe two or three years um and most of that isn't at a high level so i might do like a hand inter interdependence thing later on um we'll see though uh i don't think i'm gonna do the strafe aiming one though i just maybe if i get somebody who is actually good at strafe aiming to collab with me any idea why improving static generally takes more time? It's a common thread I've been noticing. So there's there's two factors that related to this. One is the types of games that you've been playing. I mean, obviously, if you play a ton of attack FPS, like you're probably just gonna have better static, like because that's the predominant aim mechanic in attack FPS. The second is once you get to a certain point in your static technique, in my opinion, um, I'm not the expert here, you know, somebody like Cartoon or Bardos or something might have a different opinion. It really starts to, it really starts to matter more about isolating very specific weaknesses and kind of like improving on those small little errors that you're making and then like making it a habit not to do those things. Like if you're always finding that you're just slightly off target when you, when you flick or whatever, like you over flick a little bit or or you have kind of unclean lines, you know, like you could really tell the difference between somebody who's brand new and static and somebody who is, you know, intermediate. But then once you start to get to intermediate to try to get to advanced, like they're just much smaller um, cues that you'll start to see. And it, you just kind of like hit uh, like an, a limit of sorts. It's just the skill that's kind of like easy to learn, difficult to master. It's, you know, probably the first mechanic that you should learn, in my opinion, just because it kind of sets the foundation for all sorts of aiming. But because it's not a complex skill, um, it really is more about decreasing the margin of error for the different techniques that you're performing while doing the skill, um, while performing the skill. So it just becomes noticeable that you're like, OK, I'm only barely you know, improving at like 1% of this thing and I'm just chipping away at that 1% and then finally you get it, you know, so you don't really get those big breakthroughs. Which scenarios would you recommend for Overwatch is a fast game you need a lot of tracking. My main character is Genji. I would say like Overwatch is probably, I've been playing a little bit of it lately. Overwatch to me has almost all of the different types of aim mechanics that are present in uh, aim training scenarios, particularly like XYZ type things. Like if you're, you know, a soldier and you're trying to Kill a mercy like out in the sky like you that's like fugla xyz right there like um which you don't see in a lot of games uh that don't have verticality in particular so it, it really there's so many characters in overwatch so like how you play like cassidy is going to be different from how you play like soldier you know there's going to be a lot more like dynamic clicking or like Widowmaker. so you can't i can't really say like there's scenarios for everything in overwatch um, i would say it's going to be dependent on your role dependent on your character but 
generically, you're going to have all of the aim mechanics present in a game like Overwatch, I would say. It's kind of crazy how how present all of the aim mechanics are in Overwatch. Um, and there's some dedicated routines that you can easily find uh, for Overwatch. How do you know when a reactivity scenario is too hard? I've heard that new players shouldn't start with CFSI because it's too difficult and they train bad habits instead. So um, that was my entire approach with kind of like breaking them down by dimension is you know, first having just one dimension, then having two dimensions, and then finally having three dimensions um, and just kind of slowly incorporating. How do you know when it's too hard? I would say like, if you're getting so frustrated with the practice that you contextually give up like you want to give up and you want to just walk away, which is the absolute worst thing that you can do because then you're associating a reward with failure and giving up. Um, then you want to kind of back away a little bit. Um, so you want to kind of find that sweet spot where you are frustrated, but you're also engaged and focused and you want to extend that for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, once you start to get frustrated. And then that will be the optimal zone of improvement for you. Where you are at in your aim training proficiency is going to, you know, affect what that looks like for you contextually. Like you couldn't just optimally say, when you see these exact things, then you know it's too hard. It's gonna vary by person. There's just no way around it because you're learning a complex skill and it's it's, it's gonna matter your mindset, your, your current proficiency, like your ability to, you know, have like kind of like a growth mentality. So that's my like generic advice across the board. It's just, if you're so frustrated that you want to walk away and you give up and just like, alt f4 and close out like then it's too hard for you so back away a little bit how do i know when i've graduated from x or y to x y and x y z and what should i notice yeah so it's kind of like the same type of question really it, you just want to keep that challenge going you want to keep that focus and engagement like the more complex of the scenario that you can perform without getting too frustrated that you walk away that's where you want to be ideally you get to x y and x y z as like quickly as possible um i wouldn't worry so much like people say maybe you'll develop bad habits i think that that's uh overblown personally um and i've seen that maddie overwatch has said something similar on reddit he also agrees with that i mean granted he has a ton of experience before he started aim training but i I think like part of the process of learning is to perform the skill and make mistakes. Like even if you know, like intellectually, like somebody who has had 5,000 hours in aim trainer says, don't do these things and do these things. Like you can't, ju you can't just be imbued with that knowledge. Like you have to perform it and your brain has to make those connections and associations like while performing the skill yourself. You can't like sleep on a book and then, you know, you're a neuroscientist, it's like the same type of concept, like your brain has to reshape itself. And the way that you do that is through error creation. So I would say it's like worry less about habits and worry more about being so frustrated that you walk away, which is going to be dependent on you. So somebody, I think this is a good comment to call out. He said a good friend of mine, Scenarius, uh, which you may know is Eerie Cold, has pretty much the same aim technique as uh, Mad Batman. Tense and snappy, but because he's constantly working on health of his wrist, he doesn't have any problems. Listening to your body is crucial. You need to rest when your body tells you you need tension to a point where this tension will just become a normal muscle condition. Yeah, I mean, that, that's all excellent uh, commentary. Like, I always caveat, I'm not a physician, but I mean, you are developing muscles. Like, when you're aiming, you're developing muscle control, essentially, among other things, but you are developing muscle control. So you want to find that sweet spot of, you know, developing some amount of tension uh, so that you do get some amount of soreness, healthy soreness, you know, so that your muscles can grow, you know, I mean, in, in this case, we're worried more about dexterity, we're not really worried about mass. Um, and there's other things you could do, like resistance band training. Um, I mentioned it in the video, you know, uh, you can use weights and all the different um, ranges of motion, um, because you do want to have a healthy functioning body, you know, I mean, getting cardio, getting getting exercise, in, in your arm and wrist, you know, specifically targeting those things so that you can function with endurance, you can function with the challenge of doing reactivity specifically, you know, over long periods of time. Um, so those are all great comments. Uh, you know, Cenaris slash Eerie Cold is an excellent um, 
example of an aimer. You know, he's somebody that I've followed for a very long time, makes wonderful playlists, um, kind of like hangs out in the background a little bit. Maddie Overwatch coming. Th let's go finally here. Thanks for including his advice. Maddie also produces content on um, aim training, so make sure to check out his channel if you haven't. Uh, it's always good to have more people in the community that are trying to help people. Uh, improve and learn. I'm a bit confused about the mention of under flicking. I was actively avoiding the feeling of the flick due to working on acceleration. Don't I want to avoid setting up micro corrections and tracking scenarios? Yeah, so um, somebody else, Patty, I believe, uh, Pat, Pat TS, he's somebody who's um, created scenarios and Kovacs for years. A lot of the popular ones that you might know, um, he said he likes the term under aiming as well and doesn't like the term edge tracking uh, so i kind of agree I, I should have used under aiming so it's it's completely clear when i'm saying under flicking that's what i mean when we're talking about minimizing waste no matter what you don't want to completely reverse your momentum as much as possible you want to minimize the times that you need to completely reverse your momentum that's what you're that's what you're trying to to go for <laughs> I don't know whether it's more of a smoothness scene, but I find whenever I'm tracking, I could be tracking really well. All of a sudden I make a jolting motion with my arm. I feel relaxed because my crosshair to jitter off. Is that part of the coping flick? Nah, I don't think so. Like I do this too. It's just kind of like a weird like tick. I don't know. I wouldn't worry too much about it. And this kind of goes back to the internal versus external focus. Like it's easy to get caught up on you know, focusing on things that are physical, like related to your body movements and like how you're holding the mouse or things like that. But uh, all the research that I've done on this topic, and there is significant research on this topic, by the way, I mean, we're talking decades of dozens and dozens of research papers and reviews. It all says that an external focus, i.e. you focusing on the outcome of performing the movement, like how if you're watching the aim trainer itself and like seeing if you're under flicking or over flicking, for example, is always superior to the internal focus of attention like on your body movements could i turn off my audio for all tasks to improve faster in vrt would there be any downsides to this uh so theoretically you use audio information and visual information to construct your like awareness and understanding of the world period everywhere like it, there's all these different types of memory spaces you might say if, if we're thinking about like in real life like not in an fps game you know, you have motor space, you have visual space, you have audio space. There's there are all of these things that give you information about what's happening in the world and you construct it all to like understand what's going on. So let's say in real life, like you've just robbed yourself of all audio information and you had to make decisions based on visual and motor information alone what they call proprioception which is like your awareness of where your body and limbs are in relation to your body at all times you would obviously not have access to a lot of information to be able to make decisions like if if you're walking through a crosswalk and then you don't see a car but you hear a car or you would otherwise hear a car coming to the left of you you wouldn't even know to look and and be like oh there's something coming that way it's, it's very similar with aim training in my opinion one, one thing that i always uh read about in the literature is that there needs to be when you're training it needs to be some accurate representation of the skill that you're performing when you are performing like in this case in an actual fps game so you have audio feedback in fps games so i think that you should just use caution when using the types of techniques to improve like there's a limit you know to how much it benefits you it's going to be contextual to you and like like i said people have tried different things like turning off audio or removing their crosshair um, to kind of gain access to higher amounts in one one area but you i don't think you should just do it all the time you know understand why you're doing it what you hope to get out of it and kind of like guess and check do a little bit of science like be a little scientific about it you don't have to like sit down and like put your freaking lab goggles on and like do three trials and have a control group and all that shit but like have some kind of like theory about how it's going to benefit you pay attention to whether or not it does benefit you and then kind of adjust like you always want to be in this continu continuous improvement mindset when my eye is part of my brain could i improve my vrt when i improve the speed my brain fire neurons and stuff process information also this part of less wasted mouse movement. okay uh i'm not sure i fully understand the question i mean there's going to be some and i'm not a neuroscientist by any stretch but there's going to be some just hardwired limitations in how your 
brain processes information and like a biology associated. So I wouldn't really worry about improving like the speed that your brain fires neurons. Um, it's more important to get, like I said, healthy sleep, regular exercise, meditate, not the sexy answers, but the right ones. Does training while listening to music affect performance? I did some research on this and the conclusions that I came to was essentially like, there's two competing like stimulus. Uh, one is being like too tired and the other is being too alert. So you wanna be like in this kind of golden zone where you're focused and attended, but you're not like overly focused and attended um, to the point like where you can't get you can't get feedback on any specific one thing like you're you're just all over the place like i'm sure everybody can relate to being in that type of situation and then there's the other where you're just like you can't really pay attention to anything because it's not interesting you're bored or you're too tired so you want to try to be in that golden zone um so if music helps you get to that golden zone meaning it's not distracting for you but it also isn't like putting you to sleep then yeah do it otherwise if it's causing you to be way too focused and way too busy uh where you can't focus on the thing you need to focus on which is your training and don't do it complies uh <laughs> you just one clipping every single person in apex this man has been one clipping before i even installed an aim trainer i do however have a question interested in your thoughts about training schedules how do you determine what to work on on when say i'm an apex gamer specifically do i train smoothest monday wednesday friday reactivity on tuesday thursday friday just weaknesses or static on day sunday really interested in your thoughts about skill learning and how often you recommend training for the same portion of your aim so this comes up a lot i mean i kind of already addressed it a little bit in a question earlier and <laughs> you're probably going to hate this answer but i don't think it really matters like i think it matters probably a lot more in people's heads than they think it does uh, just because they're used to something like gym um where you are you're having to think about uh you know which muscle groups you're training because like literally you can over train your muscle groups and like if you do chest three days in a row like you are gonna like tear and you possibly become injured right like so you have to consciously think about that sort of thing and bracket accordingly um it's not really the same in aim training like unless you're really pushing like specific parts of your arm, like you're hard pushing, you know, fingertip and wrist to the point that you're like really sore every day, then that's a problem. But I don't think there's any advantage to hard pushing a specific aim mechanic or just kind of like spreading out and doing like complete routines uh, every day or bracketing and saying, I'm going to work on, you know, speed TS on Wednesdays and then static on Thursdays. Like they, I really don't think that it matters. Like the, the right answer is do what keeps you focused and interested. Like some of the best aimers, we were talking about this in discord. Some of the best aimers, um, what they do is they just play the scenarios that are interesting to them. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll just kind of like try to one up each other, uh, you know, like bop each other off the leaderboards. And that is what interests and excites them. And it doesn't even matter what a mechanic it might be. It might be some stupid little gimmicky scenario, but they do that and it keeps them engaged and because they're engaged they learn better like that's how our brains work like the more engaged and focused we are the more likely and the more novel something is the more likely you are to store that information long term you're going to stamp it into your memory so the the real answer is whatever creates that kind of milieu of learning for you it, which is going to depend on you specifically and like your goals and who you are as a person and what drives you and what motivates you that is going to be the correct way to train there's no like this bracketed regimen is optimal for everyone it just doesn't exist that's my opinion i mean i i'm sure some people would disagree with me on that but all of the research that i've read about like in the literature about how motor learning works specifically which is what aiming is um it kind of agrees with that uh that belief i'm 36 years old last saturday i trained for 15 hours i'm not a good aimer every time i set up to take a break i would exit kovacs because i don't want to ref to reflect wasted hours my wrist had some sharp pain since then but i recovered some meds i'm addicted to aim training for the grind of it, it took me three <laughs> times longer to become good because i suck um i see this a lot you know and it's easy to get like for, first of all you don't suck like uh i'm 38 you know um like i said fundamentally you can only start so much into one sock uh, 
for a, a crude analogy, um, there's no like real fast track to learning and improvement. Like the way our brains are wired, we we need focus and attention and some amount of like adrenaline to pay attention to the to the thing that's different so that our brain knows to change and then it changes later during deep rest that's that's it like that's how evolutionarily if that's a word uh we evolved as human beings like for a lot of valid reasons like survival like so there's there's this thing called uh, like one pass memories which is something very different which could be traumatic or it could be very positive like the birth of a child or traumatic like you know being held at gunpoint like your brain will remember that very quickly it gets embedded into your consciousness very quickly and you'll remember it for a very long time because it's related to something like survival or something that is very important to you this is just our biology this is how our brains are wired so you training for 15 hours in a single day is like you're just wasting time like no offense but you're literally wasting your time like you can we can learn in roughly like 90 minute bouts this is what we figured out scientifically um and then there's periods of time where we're focused and alert um and there's periods of time where we're not so focused and alert during that, you know, like a warm up, a cool down. But if you're not focused and alert and interested in uh, and it's not novel to you, like what it is that you're doing and there isn't some amount of, you know, adrenaline spike or some amount of rest associated, you will never learn that information like you just won't. Um, you need to take two to three hours of breaks between learning sessions if you are going to do multiple learning sessions in a single day. Um, if you don't do that, like you can. You can sit there and you can grind for 15 hours, but two of those 15 hours were actually meaningful for you when you do it that way. So you decide how you make use of your time. I'm just telling you, that's how we learn as, as humans. Take advantage of it. How do I get into the Voltaic benchmarks? You tried for a few days. I just provided some links. They actually have a really good video that kind of like introduces people to it. I'm training with a playlist. Should we use the settings you discuss in the video? I actually have a settings video too. And usually for each one of the mechanics, I have like a section where I say, here's my suggestion for like optimal settings for that particular mechanic if you want to follow it. Do you think reactive tracking will improve flicking, like flick speed or accuracy? I'm just curious because my reactive is really bad. I think it does a little bit like with what I call continuous micro correcting, like because you're always if a bot, if like a target is constantly moving, you're constantly having to readjust your crosshair and you'll notice like some of the best reactive players have like this really kind of snappy style where they can quickly respond to the change in direction. Um, so I think that that is is meaningful. Um, but generally, when you're you're flicking in like a static type of situation, like you're using a, a powerful gun that is like a one or two tap type of mechanism. So that's a, a little different. You want to quickly acquire the target, be accurate in that hit and then, you know, click and know that you're gonna in, in hit what you want what you plan to hit so that's uh that's why there's a little bit of a difference i would say that you know to the degree that your fingertip and wrist is associated with that type of muscle movement it, they're kind of related in the troubleshooting portion of the video you mentioned overwatch playing a certain map or whatever it's just a symmetra lg 1v1 i think there's some game codes floating around out there in um overwatch community where you can you can do it yourself if you want small note 2050 i believe vss stands for variable speed strafes and yes that's correct a couple people have mentioned that to me whoops sometimes you make mistakes when you're making videos and we we learn and we move on. Supplementing training your aim and name trainers with games like Unreal Tournament with godlike bots and Instagib Mutator. I mainly, I mean, Sniper Rifle and Destiny are for me. I could see how warming up with 100 or 150 kills of fast moving reactive restricting like crazy bots can be beneficial for a game like Destiny 2. So, my general thought is like, if your training regimen is going to include doing aim trainers and then playing against uh, NPC type bots and then playing the game, I mean, I would just skip the playing against NPC, but I mean, nothing, nothing is going to replicate the behavior of human movement, like human movement. So just suck up your pride and ask people to duel. Like you really should just duel more often. Like everybody should be doing some amount of dueling, no matter what game type that you're playing, um, go into DM modes, go into like Overwatch has like all oh, those different types of quick matches while you're waiting for matches like Widow 
headshot only type things like just do that i would say like the days of having npc bots to emulate real people are like gone just because the reason why they had those back in the day and i remember because i'm old as fuck uh, is because there was not a lot of high-speed internet access. There wasn't a lot of lobbies that were just open. So you kind of had to play against bots, you know? I mean, and PvP didn't even really become a thing. And when it was, we still had modems back then. Yes, like 56K, we're talking old as shit, not high-speed internet. So don't really do, don't really play against bots. If you want to be competitive in FPS, like just don't do that. How to be a, more aware of the crosshair position most of the time. I don't think there's really any like trick to this. I think it's something you just kind of natively get as you practice. Surprisingly, like a lot of people probably disagree with me on this, but I think doing um, scenarios like Tile Frenzy, this is probably like one of the one reasons to play Tile Frenzy is it kind of helps you become aware of like your center of screen more but i don't think there's much value in just like trying to hard push that specific skill so at the age part basically older people can't even choose to practice the long amounts of time because of old age is basically just a waste of time no that's not what i'm saying um what i'm saying is that once you reach a certain age the way that you retain information the way that you learn information where your brain becomes plastic as they call it changes biologically it does this on purpose like when you're younger you your entire purpose for living is to develop new information right like because you need to learn how to walk you need to learn how to run you need to learn how to survive and you know if we're talking like caveman era like go out into the world and like hunt and gather food and like get get water and shelter like that's what i'm talking about i said before you just need to be aware of how you're training and how you're getting into training like i said before you want to be focused and attended uh for the duration of it generally people peter out around 90 minutes of one consistent learning bout and then when you get older you probably can only do one to two learning bouts a day maybe just one you know if you're younger you might be able to do it three or four times but there should be some period of rest between and does the logic also apply to games in general it goes it applies to any type of learning like if the, the number one thing you'll see repeated with top tier competitive players no matter how old they are or like where their understanding of neuroscience is like you you need to have focused like training and development like if you're going into like let's say that you want to be a competitive apex player like would you just sit there and like drop games over and over again and not pay attention to what you're doing not vod review not have like intentional purpose with what you plan to get out of that learning session then if you do that, then you're not really going to improve as a player versus somebody like Hollow who will who will VOD review every single time he dies. He'll have strategies and approaches to what he's doing when he goes into the game and what he plans to get out of that session and what he knows his specific weaknesses are or what his strengths are that he wants to build up further based on, you know, his current context and where he his goals and where he wants to be like that's the difference between learning you know playing to improve versus just playing like if you just play and then just like grind games and don't pay attention to anything then you shouldn't expect to really get better that fast right so the people that get better the fastest have that competitive mindset have that growth mindset where they're always evaluating what they need to do specifically next to improve their game it's not fun it's not easy if it was easy anybody could do it all right so now i've got the i always just do a quick community post just to give people a final opportunity to ask more questions so i'll just go through those what you'll be doing after you're done with the crash course you ever think about branching out your content or even doing more stream highlights um i'm definitely going to be branching out my content uh i've been talking about this quite a lot but i have a huge backlog uh i have an editor who's helping me so i'm going to be making a lot more shorts i'm going to be making shorter videos in general i'm going to be doing some streams um, i'm just going to be experimenting with a lot of different things and see what works the best based on my style and like how i how i do content so just and if anybody has suggestions of the types of things that they want to see i'm always up for feedback what advice would you have training on inverted aim is inverted aim a disadvantage to me i don't think so i mean ultimately like the way that you understand movement and this is kind of crazy because this is how our brains work um but the way that you understand movement and its relationship of like your 
how you move your your muscles and and your your body overall and like the relationship with its visual space like you can you can create those connections like you can just establish that uh there's a lot of great studies in neuroplasticity you know tons that kind of prove that especially at a young age that's how they kind of came up with the idea of uh neuroplasticity tapering off after a certain age they would do experiments where they skewed people's vision by like 30 degrees so if like you go out to reach for like a glass like and you think it's there it's actually not there because of how they skewed your visual space um and younger children were able to make adjustments within days like so and then that just becomes you know your standard your understanding of like the world i know it sounds crazy but that's really how our brains work so ultimately like if that's how you've learned like that's you like it's there's no there's nothing stopping you from from having that um that visual and motor and like proprioceptive understanding thoughts on training if someone uses mouse excels in normal games would you recommend training with excel on or off with multiple senses i mean if you're comfortable with changing sensitivities and you've gotten used to that like i have i mean a lot of people that are good in the aim scene have gotten used to that then it, sh it shouldn't have much effect on you i can change between you know 20 and 40 cm and get used to it within an hour now like it's to me like that's the advantage if you want to use mouse excel is just getting used to changing sensitivities then it's not gonna affect you very much how to stop being lazy when tracking i always snap and start to track thinking of if i've got the target and then it moves and it's almost a delay i see them moving but it's as if i feel like i got the kill with a bot subconsciously when i don't i mean the best thing that you can do is to like consciously think about what you're performing as you're performing it like intentionally um, that's how your brain like turns intentional thought into kind of like something that's more reflexive. So no matter what it is that you're trying to improve on, like the more that you can kind of zero in on um, and narrow your attention and your focus onto something that you're trying to improve and figure out like the better. So I would say like focus on that, like literally just say, just tell yourself like not to do that thing when you're, when you're doing it and just do that for like the entirety of the training session. Some said that playing with a high sends and low FLB will improve smoothness. Yeah, a lot of people have experimented with, I mean, I do talk about high sensitivities. Higher sensitivities kind of forces you to use different parts of your arm. Um, and I think that's the number one reason, honestly, why most people experience some amount of improvement because if you use like a really low sends and you're going to use more of your upper arm and your shoulder and you'll probably have weakness in your fingertip and wrist so by going to a higher sends you're forcing yourself to improve with your fingertip and wrist so that's probably the main reason why people see benefit there and low fov just kind of like forces the speed to really show up it becomes more pronounced because of what we talked about earlier with your relationship and visual space and things appearing closer or further from you makes them uh, appear much like they're moving much faster when they're closer to you or appear closer to you so it's certainly something that you can do uh, i want to know what am i supposed to do now what do i do with my life i'm directionless wandering an endless desert of sadness well you give me feedback on the types of videos that you want to see the types of content that you want me to put out um, so i know what to prioritize next in my pipeline because i have a lot of content that i want to create uh, but i need people to tell me what they want to see as well do you have opinions on stretched res it sounds like a placebo but i can't find much hard data on it uh i mean me personally i'd never play at stretch res i always just play native i know a lot of people prefer it i think it really just comes down to preference if i'm making an assessment like i can understand why people would feel comfortable like with like a more square type of aspect ratio versus a more vertical one so i think it just comes down to what you're used to what you like uh what works for you i don't think that there's a better or worse aspect ratio or stretch stretching the res i know that there is some technical information about how your video card like processes uh, and renders, you know, GPU data like to display it on your monitor that has to do with like lowering input lag by putting less stress on how the image needs to be projected, like for you to be able to see it. So I'd say that's probably the only advantage from a technical standpoint, there might be less input lag associated with it. So it just really depends on the person. Some people really like to hard push and like minimize input lag as much as humanly possible, like to the point where they won't use like a wireless mouse for example um so it just depends on you like if you want to 
absolutely minimize every single possible source of input lag, then you might want to go for stretch res. A topic that says random training is more effective or blocked training. So I talked about that quite a lot already, so I won't go into this detail, but I will say that whatever is more effective for you is what keeps you engaged and interested, period. Like, I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. And I'd be happy to have a discussion with somebody who feels differently, but I I honestly think that's what it comes down to and all the literature uh, kind of supports that. So I think that was all the comments. Thank you again for uh, joining me on this whole journey. Uh, It's been, I think, over a year now since I started making this Uh, series and it kind of evolved over time. I had some ideas on what I wanted it to be when it started out and it definitely changed. I'm really excited to get back into uh, more regular op tempo for content release. Um, So again, join my discord, uh, check out my memberships. If something is interesting, looks interesting to you that I provide as a resource. Uh, I've got 10 or 15 members now. I want to say maybe 20. So thank you to all of the people who have supported me in my memberships as well. And I'm, I'm really excited to make like kind of a, um, a celebration stream. So let me know the types of things that you would want to see in that, um, ideas for what we could do, have some fun with it and like subscribe, tell your friends and I'll see you next time.